Thank you guys, man. You guys look great this morning, and it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. And in a little bit, we're going to be participating and taking Holy Communion, so get yourself right. If you have unforgiveness towards someone, get before Jesus right now, and I'm just, I'm not making light of that, but you know, let that person go. Come on now. Amen. God is love. Amen. Thank you guys. We are good. Amen. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, back there. Michael, you still single? Yes? Sort of? Oh, he's turning the other way, but I think he's single. But anyway, listen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for what you're going to say and do. God, we thank you, Lord, that today is a great day. It's the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, I'm going to open up with a story, and, um, and you're going to like it. Amen. I can't say that if it's a true story or not, but it's about Joe and Malcolm. Joe and Malcolm. Everyone say Joe and Malcolm. <clears throat> Joe is white, and Malcolm is black. And so they lived next door to each other, and ever since they were little, there was a fierce spirit of competition between the two. Fierce. Like, I mean, fierce, fierce. So in kindergarten, Joe would open up his lunchbox and he would, he would show Malcolm. He said, look at, look at what my mama did. She, she made this homemade peanut butter and jelly sandwich with the crunchy Skippy, you know, and everything. And then all of a sudden, Malcolm opens up his lunchbox and he takes out these brownies and the whole aroma fills the room and Joe gets so ticked off because, you know what I'm saying? He's thinking, man, I want those brownies, you know, so, so Malcolm up on him one, you know what I mean? And so this competition kept going on and going on and uh, they get in elementary school. Malcolm was the fastest kid in the school, but Joe was the strongest kid in the school. And so they would constantly try to outdo each other and just would go on. And then they, they'd go to high school. In high school, Joe made varsity quarterback. And Malcolm made the varsity running back, uh, running back and he broke the rushing record that year. And just going at it and going at it and going at it. Listen, in high school, Malcolm was nominated for prom king. But Joe was dating the head of the cheerleaders. And so they just kept throwing it in each other's face all the time. Joe got a full scholarship to USC. Malcolm got a full scholarship to UCLA. <laughs> so going back and forth, back and forth. In their first year... Malcolm wins the Heisman Trophy, but Joe wins a national championship. <laughs> going back and forth, going back and forth. And as they kept going and got married and, and stuff like that, they even ended up living on the same block. And every time Joe would paint his house, Malcolm would paint his house too. Every time Malcolm got new new porch, Joe would get a new porch too. And they just kept going. And, 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 and Malcolm got, you know, one time they were just talking these. And he, Malcolm says, you know, Joe, you know, that portrait of Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes, you know that he ain't, Jesus ain't white. And, and, and uh, Joe said, what are you talking about? Jesus is white. He has blonde hair and blue eyes, you know. And they would go back and forth and back and forth. And Malcolm even said, well, you know, Moses was black. And Joe, and so if Jesus was born in Israel, you know, they're like more olive skinned people. So he said he wasn't white. So he would just go back and forth. Competition in everything. So listen, as destiny would, would hold, Malcolm and Joe die at the same time. They die at the same time. And so they're sitting there and in heaven, they're waiting for Peter to open up the gate. And, 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 and uh, Joe goes over to Malcolm. See, now you're going to see, you're going to see Jesus has blonde hair and blue eyes, and he is white. Malcolm said, you're crazy. I guarantee you the brother is not white, you know. Just going back, they're waiting, itching, and all of a sudden, Peter, St. Peter comes in, and he opens up the gate, and he says, okay, God wants to see you too. So, <laughs> so, so they go walking in down the thing, and here's God. You know, God's over here, and he has his back to them. He has, his, he has his back. I'll show you in a minute. But so all of a sudden, Malcolm hits, hits Joe. He says, 
Now you're going to see. You know, we may have been in competition, but I'm telling you right now, Jesus is black. And Joe says, I'm telling it. He's, Joe is laughing. He's laughing. He said, no, no, Jesus is white. So, so they turn around like this, and they're waiting for God to turn his back and greet them. And all of a sudden, they're just hitting each other. And all of a sudden, God says, hola, mis amigos. <laughs> Dios te bendiga. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? That, Billy, that's a good one, right, Billy? <laughs> Hola, mis amigos. Yes, Jesus could be Hispanic. Listen. <laughs> what is... <laughs> what is... Eternal life. What is eternal life? You know, I tell you, we, we talk about this God stuff, and we talk about, you know, all these things, and Jesus Christ. But well, listen, well, what is eternal life? What is eternal life? And we just say, well, we die, we live with God forever. But you know, there's a definition in John chapter 17, verse 3. Mark's going to put it up on the screen. And this is what Jesus said eternal life is. Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Let me say that again. This is eternal life. Everyone say, this is eternal life. <laughs> that they may know, know you, the only true God, that we may know the Father and Jesus Christ, whom God the Father sent. That's what eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is not about you receiving God and trying to, to clean yourself up to a certain level that you are now acceptable unto God. Come on now. Some of the religious people are starting to twitch their head. Listen, come on now. My walk with Christ is not about me trying to clean myself up. My walk with Christ is about knowing him. And as I know him, it is natural that I begin to take upon his attributes. You know what's amazing that night, and I shared this with you, some of you guys last week, but when I was on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus when I was 19 years old, when I was crying and the spirit of the Lord came upon me, let me tell you something, when I got up from that, it didn't take a rocket scientist type knowledge to know that, you know what, I need, I want to get into the word. I want to, man, I've never felt the presence of God before, Keith. So I'm sitting there and I was like, I want this. I've never experienced this in my life. And as I began to grow in God, it's amazing how the bad um, uh, or, or the, the, the stuff that was against God's word or, or the way that I was living that just wasn't upright and, and lack of character and integrity, it just seemed to line up. It seemed to line up. You know, one thing that, that I still don't understand why, because um, I grew up with a father who was very, very generous and throughout all my youth, and I know that there's, there, was some, there was some things there because we didn't have like a lot of money. And so when, we saw, when I saw people have like Nike sneakers or certain things, you know, that there was a side of me that I was like, I was a hustler. And I was always trying to hustle somebody out of something. If I didn't steal it, I was hustling. And my father was so not like that. My brother younger than me was not like that. And I, and I said, why am I so selfish, you know? And, but listen, when Jesus came into my life, it's amazing that the hustler and the thief turned into a person that would never rob or steal or want to do anything and, or, or, or manipulate anyone. Why? Because the nature of Jesus came into my life. I encountered the man. I encountered the Christ. And Christ began to work in my life as I got to know him. My prayer life when I got saved, I don't know how yours was, but when I received Jesus, my prayer life wasn't like, clean me, clean me, clean me. My, my prayer life was actually like, I want to know you. Who are you? Why did you make me? My questions weren't why, why I was so bad. My questions were like, who are you? What, what's the plan that you have for my life? Why? Like, I don't understand what that Holy Spirit thing that happened in my room was. And I began to talk to God and I began to have experiences with God that were eternal life type experiences because what God ultimately wants to do is he wants to fellowship with you. 
And God loves you and your friends and your family. And listen, all those people that, that you've been praying for that they don't know God yet, do you know that God loves them more than you? Do you know that he wants them to know him more than you do? I remember this preacher when he did an altar call and, and, and I, all these young people came up and I remember what he said. It, it, it hit my heart so strong. But he told all those young people at the altar and he, this is what he said. But it's so true. He said, do you know that God has been waiting your whole life for this moment? I was like, wait. I said, I mean, I, I said wait a minute. That is powerful. God has been waiting your whole life for this moment. Because he wants to know you. That is so powerful. So God loves your friends and your family more than you do. He, he's in partnership with you because he loves them. He created them. So I want to show you something so powerful before we, before we partake of Holy Communion. I want you to go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And if you have never heard um, this expedition of Paul... It is going to, to really bless your life. I promise you that it will bless, bless, and bless your life. Amen? Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> and so Paul was just at a city called Berea, okay? And the, the people that lived in Berea were the Bereans, okay? And some of you know this term because the Bereans, what they were known for, they were very philosophical, very intellectual people. And when Paul was preaching to them, everything Paul said, they wanted to make sure that it lined up with the scriptures. We need to have a Berean spirit. Amen? So the Bereans were, were, would always look into this, but, then, but some Jewish people got jealous that they were preaching, because remember, Jewish people don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Savior, that he was the Savior that was pro prophesied about in the book of Isaiah, and in and, and the book of Ezekiel, and all these different other prophecies. So they didn't believe that. So when Paul was drawing these crowds, the, 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 there were some Jewish people that got jealous, so they started a ruckus. And so what they did was, is that the disciples got Paul out of there. And so what they did was, they sent him to, to Athens. They sent him to the city of Athens. And this is where our story is going to take place. Just a couple of little details that are so important. At the end of, of chapter 16, you can see that there was instructions by Paul to send Silas and Timothy. He was preaching with Silas and Timothy in Berea, and they, but they only took Paul. And Paul, when he got there, he said, I want you to go get Silas and Timothy. Those were his, those were his boys. Those were the guy that he was doing ministry with. So, so important. Now listen, in chapter Chapter 17, at verse 16, it says this. While Paul was waiting for them, who was he waiting for? He said, send Silas and Timothy. So he, while he was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Let me give you another translation out of the King James Version. It says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly or completely given over to idolatry. When he saw that the city... So he goes into the city and he's waiting for his, his friends to come so they can continue ministering. And he notices that there's idols everywhere. He sees statues. He sees columns. He sees all these things that represent these gods. And listen, I just want to read the definition of idol. Real, what, what, what is an idol, uh, you know, according to Webster? It says, listen, it's a representation or symbol of an object of worship. Listen, a false god. The second definition, it's a likeness of something. A pretender, an imposter. It is a form or appearance visible, listen, but without substance. It's a form or appearance visible, but without substance. An object of extreme devotion, listen, and a false conception. The one that stood out to me is that these statues, as they were laying around, all these altars and statues that they worshipped, these, these, the, all these different false gods, is that they, they had an appearance of something big, but there was no substance in them. There was no substance in them. And listen, and, and Paul, his heart was grieved 
when he sees all these idols. Because listen, and I guarantee you, can I tell you this? I guarantee you that if, Paul, if any anger was in Paul, his anger wasn't at the people like, you guys are dummies and all these different things. And his, if anything, he was angry at the devil. Because he had the truth. He knew that the only true God and these poor people bowing down to these statues that have a form of appearance of power but are just an imposter. And these people dedicating and laying down at these, at these idols. And so he, I guarantee you that Paul in his heart was just like, wow. So the, he takes notice of all the idols and if you go to verse 17, it says, so he reasoned in the synagogue. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Listen, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute, argue with him, and some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating or trying to push up on us these foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Church, can I tell you something? More and more. I wish this wasn't true, but more and more that you will see that the word resurrection, you're not going to hear that word resurrection a lot in the things that are happening. And listen, and trust me when I tell you, I believe, I, listen, I don't believe, I know in my spirit that a mighty move of God is going to sweep across America. God is going to awaken people. They're going to be able to see God in his fullness and, and everything. And many people will be saved. But I'm telling you something. Sometimes before it gets brighter, it gets darker. And I will tell you this, it's amazing that how many, how many um, uh, places of worship, they don't talk about the resurrection. They don't talk about salvation or the good news. You're going to see what, what, so Paul goes into this city and he sees these idols. And listen, so what he begins to talk about is the resurrection. That it's good news. Come on now, that's good news. You ever, go, you ever go visit a church and stuff like that and you look around and people look so serious like they're angry or upset or something. Like you just like, they're just, you know, like upset. Man, we need to be joyful in the house of the Lord. Amen? Jesus is alive. He's not a statue. Jesus is alive. He's not an idol. Come on now. He's the son of God. Listen. I know a lot of people get hung up when you see Jesus on the cross and all these things and the Catholic thing and all that stuff. But I'll tell you something. He's not on the cross anymore. He's not on the cross. He resurrected. Hallelujah. He's alive praying for you and for me. Verse 19. And then they took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. Listen, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. These guys were philosophers. They just loved to exchange ideas. Oh, you know, how, you know, look at the sun. You know, I wonder how far the sun is. And these guys were just all about knowledge. Knowledge was their God. And they begin to talk. And so they go to Paul and they said, we want to know what it is that you're talking about, this God that you're talking about. Because remember, listen, they served hundreds of gods, thousands of gods. Everything, you know, in India, you know, it, it, it's amazing that you got to be careful what you do. Be, that's why they don't eat cow, because cow is one of their main gods. And, and, and our hearts should break that, you know what, that, that they were created in the image and the likeness of the Father, and here they are bowing down to a cow. And can I tell you something? One of the saddest things about India that will break your heart is they, they have a class system, and, and actually people, there's like a fifth class of people that they're below animals. They're below dogs, and that's how they treat them. Evangelists go when they go preach to India and they preach to that lower level of people. Listen, when the preacher goes, they make the preachers preach for hours and hours and hours and minister to people. And one of the reasons is that because they ask, the pastors ask, when you pray for the person, can you give them a hug? 
And the pastors are like, yeah, I'll give them a hug. And so they just sit there and hug the people. Do you know the people line up by the thousands? Because no one hugs them. Because they're below animals. Isn't that terrible? Below animals. They just want to hug because nobody hugs them. Come on now. That's powerful. Verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Now, can I tell you something, church? That's not an insult. Let me tell you what Paul is going to do. Paul is looking for an open door so that he can preach the gospel to them. He, this, this is a compliment. He's saying, I see that you guys are very religious. You're dedicated. What does religious mean? I'm dedicated. I have structure. I, I believe in something. I, I see that you guys are very religious. So he's trying to find a door. Listen, let's continue. Verse 23, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Everyone say, to an unknown God. <laughs> Listen to what he says to them. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Paul found something that they related to, that they had a question mark about. This unknown God. Now here comes a man. These people say that there's, there's this unknown God. And Paul comes and says to them, I know this God that you don't know. I want to tell you about him. And he begins to tell them. Now listen, listen to what he says. He says, now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples Built by hands. Come on now, church. He's going to get their attention. Because remember, all, they, all that they see is idols and places where you can go in and find God. And, and he says, listen, God does, he, he doesn't need to be inside of a building. Listen to what he says. And he's not served by human hands. You can see it on the screen if you don't have your Bible. Verse 25. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself, listen, God himself gives all men life and breath, and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them in the exact places where they should live. Verse 27, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him, in Jesus, we live and we move and we have our being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's not far from each one of us. Oh, how many people around us are searching for God, searching for purpose. They don't know if they're an atheist, if they're agnostic. They don't know what they are. They, they believe that there's a, they use the word energy. There's a great energy and all these different things. And they're searching, not knowing that the God who created them, that, that God's DNA already lives inside of them. Come on now. Do you know that? Do you know that every single thing has God's DNA in it? I don't know if you ever thought about that. You have Adam's DNA in you. You are created in God's image and likeness. So when God breathed into the dust of the earth, when he created Adam, that breath, whew, that's all inside of you. I can't say this enough because it's amazing, but you know the scientific community, they can explain a lot of things, but the one, one, of, the, one, of, the, one of the things they can't explain that, that make, makes them scratch their head is a principle It's called gluon. Like glue, G-L-U-E, on, glue on. That's what they call it. And here's what the glue on principle is. The glue on principle that they can't understand is that each one of us, you, you're formed from trillions and whatever amount of cells. That's what you are. You're a bunch, your hair is cells. Every part of you is cells. And what they can't understand is how do those cells stick together? Because by theory, you should just dissipate, like float off, like into trillions of little pieces. 
And they can't understand how do those cells stay together. You know why? Because the Spirit of God holds them together. They can't explain what God knows. Man can try to be as smart as they want, but they will never be as smart as God. Hallelujah. Let me read verse 20, 27 again just one more time. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and we have our being. As some of your own poets, listen, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. Listen, you know what he, he, what he did right there? He used one of their own poets. I want to put it in our words. He used the song by Michael Jackson, a verse in a song, to sit there. Just, yeah, you know, Michael said this, that we're created... That, that, that we're the offspring of God. I'm just putting it in words that we can understand. And, and so what, what was he doing? He was using something that they know to get a door in to speak into their life. Church, let me tell you something. When it comes to, to people, listen, build a bridge. Find something to talk about. If I'm talking to, I've, I've done it, I've, if I've talked to big athletes before, I was like, man, I said, what do you, I said, what do you bench press, you know? Oh, I bench press this. I said, man, do you know, and, and, this, and I flipped the script, I said, do you know God made you big like that and strong so that you could be a witness to other people? You just got to flip it on them. You know that God made you smart? Because there's people that need your help. Do you know that you're going to be a doctor because there's, that God wants to use your gift that he gave you so that you can help other people? Paul was looking for an in. He said, even as your own poets have said, we are, we are the offspring of God. Let me finish here. In the past, verse 30, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to do what? To repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. What does that mean? They were like, yeah, okay. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Listen, a few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Di Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. I want to just say this to you, church. Not everyone we share the gospel with is going to receive Jesus. Some will laugh. Some will say, can we talk about this again? But there's a third group. And will say, I want to pray with you. And I want to tell you right now that we, that if, if you make your heart available for God, if you make your heart available to talk to someone, I'm telling you, God will put the words on your tongue to be able to minister to them. Listen, there's not a person in this place, even the new people I met, and I can tell you this before, Jesus, there's not a person in this place that I don't care about. There's not a per as I look around this crowd, I know in my heart I love every person here. That God puts something inside the pastor's heart where he just sees, and I see your needs and your hurts and your pains and, and all those things, and it breaks my heart. And I can get up here and, and listen, and service after service, and I can talk about God's going to heal your pain and God's going to deliver you of this. And we, we will always talk about God's delivering power and God's healing power and God's goodness and all those things. But can I tell you something? Do you know that one of the most selfish, hear how I say this, one of the most selfish or self-absorbed things that you can do is preach the gospel? I know I've got some of you thinking. How is that selfish, Pastor? Because the feeling that you get that is something supernatural when you share the gospel with someone. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's like a drug. You know why? Because you're doing the will of God. And here's another thing. 
Did you know that as you witness, do you know that those souls go to your account, the Bible says? Do you know when you rescue someone out of darkness, that goes to your account? I know you've heard this statement. The only thing that you'll ever be able to take with you into heaven is a soul. You ain't going to take your car. You're not going to take your retirement account. You're not going to take your house. You're not going to take those nice Michael Kors earrings. You're not going to take anything. The only thing that you can take with you is a soul. The Bible says that one day there'll be tears in heaven. What are those tears? Those tears of people that you could have told about the Lord. But thank God that Jesus said, he said he's going to wipe away every tear. But you know what? I'd rather not have so many tears that he has to wipe. Because, because the less tears that he has to wipe means that there's more souls that heard the word of God. And I want to I wanna help us all to start to transform and transition our thinking. Instead of being so self-focused, that we are outside focused. I want you to be, be able to sniff an opportunity for souls. I want you to be able to say, man, this would be something that we can do, that we can get behind and, and reach out to people. My cousin was just here. Um, and we took, we only got to see her for, for about three hours. Um, <clears throat> she works for, um, I, I still don't even know what she does, but I know she works for some huge company in, in Miami that they actually run, I don't know how many charter schools all nationwide. So her boss is like in charge of running the accounting, the health benefits and all this stuff for, for all these charter schools across America. And, and so she had to go help this school um, over here uh, in Koreatown. So when I went to go, Joanne and I went to go pick her up, we go and we pull up and I see my cousin, we hug her and her friend came with us and we, you know, um, but she introduced me to the principal of the school. And so I'm talking to him, his name is David. And um, so, so my cousin gets in the car and she begins to tell us of how many hundred, listen, over a hundred students in that school that their parents make them stay in the after school program. Let me tell you why they do that. Because at the, if they stay, they'll eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If they go home, they don't have money for dinner at home. So the parents make them stay in Los Angeles, in our city. You don't got to go to Kenya, praise God. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about right here. Kids don't have food. So what happens? You begin to sniff opportunities where, people, where you can be a blessing and release things. And I don't have all the ideas yet, but I just know I'm going to meet with David. And I'm going to say, how can we get involved with doing, you know, Marty does a lot of coaching and, and things and, uh, nationwide. And, you know, just to get some ideas, how, how can we go in there and talk about bullying or something like that and open the door for a relationship where, where in the future we can have an event that is off property where we can preach the love of Jesus to those people. Come on, you got to, so listen, because you got to go into Athens and you got to see all the idols. And you got to sit there. Listen, think about Paul. Do you know that he was short? Here's this little, the, he was a short dude. And he believes, he walks into a city and believes that he, just him, can make a difference in the city. Come on. Are you serious? We can make a difference. Church, can I tell you something? I know you may not believe me. You try sharing with someone the love of God. When you walk away, I guarantee, listen, I, I'm telling you 1,000%. I know there's no such thing. So, 100%. You will feel fulfilled. It's something supernatural that happens because Jesus, you're doing the will of God the Father. God wants to increase his family. And I want us to be praying, saying, God, will you make me more of a witness? Will you make me more of a, listen, it may be holding the door for somebody. It may be asking them, do you need prayer for anything? It could be taking one of the cards that we have and inviting them out for Resurrection Sunday. Whatever it is, listen, I want you to think there's idols everywhere. People, listen, 
And we don't have a whole bunch of statues all over the place in L.A., but let me tell you what we do have. We have a bunch of idols. I watch people on Hollywood Boulevard, you know, going and worshiping these handprints on the, on the cement by all these people, taking pictures with, with all these different things. We have movie stars that are idols. We have public figures that are idols. We have restaurants that are idols. Everyone has idols. But I tell you, we need to put Jesus on the throne of our heart. Amen? Come on, give him praise this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to ask our praise and worship team to come. And, um, and I'm going to ask also... If